Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Zara Toxus, program maker at the Bali, and I organize this evening. Uh, the topic, uh, sensitive, very much discussed topic, of course, uh, but what I realized was it's mostly discussed within the own Kurdish, Turkish, Armenian, Dutch community. So the aim of tonight is also to bring these different narratives together. Um, and um, I want to thank Ohanes Karakas and also Inge Drost for thinking along with me. And if you have any questions about this program or the Bali, you can come to me after the program. And of course, in the program itself, there will be uh, much room for uh, questions for the speakers. I'd now like to introduce Ilko Bos van Rosenthal, the moderator. He will lead you through this evening. He's presenter and journalist at Newsuur. So I'll give the floor to you and enjoy everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you everyone and thanks for coming tonight uh, to the Bali, uh, which is the place for debate in Amsterdam, as you may have noticed today. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, this evening, like Zara said, is regarding a very sensitive topic. We will talk about the Armenian genocide, or as the Dutch cabinet still prefers to call it, the matter of the Armenian genocide, uh, which we will discuss later. Historians, uh, many other countries, other researchers, the Pope, the Council of Europe, most international media, do recognize what happened in 1915 as a genocide, as a massacre which still influences politics and identities in and outside current Turkey. Tomorrow, the Armenian genocide will be commemorated since April 24, 1915 was the day at which the Ottoman authorities started rounding up and deporting Armenian intellectuals and community leaders. In the years following, an estimated 1.5 million of Armenians would be killed. Why is it still important to talk about this today? What is the impact of the genocide today? That will be our discussion. There is room for uh, questions, mostly after the panel talk, so that will be in about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but before that, we listen to two very personal stories, um, and I'm very glad they're here. I'll welcome our first guest um, first, Tato Marti Russian. She's a linguist and writer. And from her own Armenian background, she will tell us what commemorating the genocide means for her and how she feels about reconciliation, since that's such an important um, part of our discussion today. So please welcome Tato. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I knew him very well, um, the Turk, and actually, Everyone knew him in my home country, Armenia. But I never uh, had met anyone who had actually met a Turk in real life. Because you have to imagine that the Turk lives in Armenia on the screen between pages of books and in our language, where there's a special place reserved for him in insults. You can insult someone calling him a Turk or a son of a Turk. Um, because I knew as a child what every Armenian child is supposed to know, that the Turks smeared our history with blood. And the first time I met a Turk, actually in real life, I remember very clearly, it was in the Netherlands, 
and I had migrated with my family to, from Armenia to the Netherlands. I was nine years old, and I met Furkan for the first time. To my surprise, Furkan was quite a normal child. He didn't have a mean grin on his face as I had expected. He didn't have this menacing mustache because he was only nine years old, just like me. And uh, uh, he was quite normal. However, I clearly remember being very afraid, very tensed, and uh, feeling this feeling of mistrust. I didn't trust him and I didn't like him. I didn't know anything about him. I did know that he was a Turk. So I decided to not to speak to Furkan, not to look at him, and to avoid every type of contact. Of course, this decision didn't really withstand because we were just kids. So it was inevitable that we started playing with each other, talking with each other. And as the amount of words grew between us, so the amount of mistrust diminished. And Furkan became, he transfor transformed from Turk to classmate, from uh, demon to person. To be honest, I had forgotten all about Furkan until one year when I was in Armenia. I was 16 years old and I was in Armenia spending the summer and I had met an Armenian student. He was very kind, very polite, highly intelligent. And during uh, the course of speech, uh, I randomly uh, said that I had Turkish friends in the Netherlands. After this, we, uh, the talk, the discussion uh, escalated and it became uh, a fight. Uh, he said that I had forgotten all about my Armenian heritage, that I wasn't a real Armenian, that uh, I was a betrayer, and uh, that I clearly didn't understand what being a true Armenian uh, meant. The same year, I went to Istanbul, and I met a girl, Hatice, who was my colleague uh, doing an internship on linguistics. We kind of became friends, I liked her a lot, and on the day when I was supposed to come back to the Netherlands, Hatice also randomly stated that uh, she wouldn't talk to her brother anymore if he married an Armenian girl, and that her family would never accept, uh, their, accept him as a son and that she would understand. So after this, after, uh, after this summer, I slowly became to realize that apparently time doesn't heal always, that uh, both our nations, Armenians and Turks, are suffering from the same trauma, from the same history. So if time doesn't heal, what does? I asked myself. And during the course of years, I realized that it's us that need to heal each other. We Armenians need Turks to heal our wounds, and Turks need Armenians to heal their wounds. Because I asked myself, um, how is it possible that something that happened such a long time ago, 100 years ago, still has so much effect on my people, on the Armenian people, and on the Turkish people? When I tried to find answers, um, I realized that um, my story, my personal anecdote with Furkan, it's actually spread all over our nations. It's, you can easily replace Furkan with the Armenian society and the Turkish society and the Armenian communities in the diaspora and the Turkish communities. The level of mistrust and dehumanizing and de demonizing is very uh, present in both our narratives because we both suffer from narratives of victimhood and of uh, being a perpetrator. So why is it important then to remember something of such a long time ago? Firstly, because I believe that uh, to overcome a trauma on a personal level and on a larger level, the first step is to recognize it. If we do not recognize something, how are we supposed to heal from it? How are we supposed to overcome it? That's why I believe that um, <coughs> talking about it meeting uh, each other in person and uh, having dialogues and recognizing the um, um, effects of the uh, past is essential to understand our present and uh, for shaping our future. This future, I hope, will be one where we will be freed from a mutual hatred, 
where Armenians and Turks will be freed from their burdens, where my people, the Armenian people, will shake off the burden of victimhood. I hope that it will be a future that the month April will not only become a month to commemorate the death, but also to celebrate the living, to celebrate survival, that it will become a month of April to live. That is what I wanted to talk to you about. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Tato. Um, we will go straight to our second speaker, Typhoon Balcik. He grew up in a Turkish family in Amsterdam. He studied history at Leiden University and now works at the Hague Peace Projects as a program coordinator for the Armenian-Turkish Kurdish Working Group, meant for dialogue, uh, like Tato said, between these groups. He is also a member of the New Amsterdam Raad, the new Council of Amsterdam, which is an independent council advising on topics such as migration and social cohesion, and we can need a lot of that. So please welcome Typhoon Balcik. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to see uh, friends, uh, Armenians, Kurds, Turks. And uh, I just want to cherish this moment because it doesn't happen a lot that Turks, Kurds, and Armenians come together at this painful uh, uh, moment, 23 April, the day before uh, uh, more than 250 people were uh, arrested and eventually killed in the east of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And um, yeah, I made a presentation um, um, in which I will yeah, talk mainly about my own personal story uh, uh, as growing up in Amsterdam West and also uh, as a historian studied uh, the Armenian Genocide and, um, and finally, I will also focus on what is the, sta what is the status quo and, and what to do hereafter. Okay, let's see if this works. Yeah. Um, so, my parents came here uh, in the end of the 70s uh, as uh, guest workers, gastarbeiders, and uh, to work here for maybe five years, six years, and then go back. That didn't happen. We all know the story. Um, we stayed, uh, they stayed, and then uh, we were born, my brother, me, and my younger brother in the 80s. And um, yeah, I was born in a Turkish family. In, uh, and and uh, it was not only Turkish, but it was also very Turkish nationalist. Uh, my, my father, uh, yeah, he still talks about the, the great Ottoman past and, and that we ruled over three continents and, and uh, about Fatih Sultan Mehmed who conquered Constantinople, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk who defeated the imperialists and saved the country. So these are the stories I over and over and again heard and still hear. Um, and yeah, I was brought up with yeah, a big sense of Turkishness and I also had to buy um, from a shop uh, in our neighborhood uh, the Hurriyet, it's a daily uh, paper, uh, meaning uh, uh, freedom. Uh, and, and I was troubled by, not troubled, but I said, who is this? And my father said, that's Atatürk, he saved the country. And I also said, what is this? Turkey, Türklerindir, meaning Turkey is from the Turks. Uh, I said, I thought, yeah, that, that's logical. Uh, well, why should you state that? But he said, yeah, it is, of course, uh, logical, but they also want to take Turkey away from us, and, and they want to separate people from inside and from outside. This whole idea of, of uh, this angst, uh, fear of, of that Turkey would be divided again, and which is also historically called the Sever syndrome. And, um, and I said, who, who want to do that? He said, Armenians, Kurds, 
uh, imperialist, English, French. Um, uh, so that was one anecdote. And I also, and this is um, uh, at kindergarten at Frederick Hendricks School. Uh, it's not far, far from here. And yeah, we celebrated, of course, the, uh, the St. Nicholas uh, party of uh, St. Nicholas with Zwarte Piet, you can see him there. It's also a big troubled <laughs> discussion here in the Netherlands. Um, but segregation was my, is, 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 the, is, is still a part of, of, of my um, a st a story, as a personal story. I grew up in a migrant neighborhood uh, in Old West and, and um, uh, with a lot of Turks and uh, Moroccans or yeah, sons of uh, children of uh, immigrants. And um, there is another anecdote I want to share with you, is that one day there, we had a new uh, kid uh, in, in, in the class, and his name was Mevlut. Uh, um, he had uh, dark hair, brown eyes, and, and he spoke also Turkish, so I thought this is the perfect combination to invite him to my home. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, so he came, and, and my father was uh, at home, and he said, hey, a new, a new face, uh, what's your name? He said, Mevlut. Uh, uh, and where are you from, like all Turks say to each other? Uh, he said, Malatya. Then my father said, are you Kurdish? And um, the Mevlut said, yes, I'm Kurdish, as if he was guilty of something. And I never forget that moment, because I thought Turk, Kurd, what's the difference? Uh, but I still remember that uh, moment vividly. And that was also the last time that Mevlut was in our home again. Um, so uh, another moment is, um, yeah, we went to Turkey once in, a, once in five years because we were also very poor. Um, and I, I went to Turkey, and uh, my mother bought, in 1995, uh, um, a shirt, a t-shirt from uh, the Dappermarkt in Amsterdam East. Uh, and, and this is me. And you see a wolf. There was a wolf on the shirt. And when my uncle saw me, he said, oh, my nephew from, uh, the Ho from Holland, he is already a gray wolf. And, and I thought, gray wolf? Uh, uh, so and he told he told he told these stories about uh, uh, about uh, uh, Turkish Islamic supremacy, about uh, the signs and and that you have to be a proud Turk, and uh, also it was in the 90s, so you had the struggle against the PKK in the southeast. So I heard the, all these stories from my uncle. They were also conscripts, and uh, yeah, so I was brought up as a as a, a good gray wolf with sympathies for Turkishness. And yeah, what do you do if you hear, hear these stories? You come back to the, yeah, to New West. When I was eight, we moved to New West. And yeah, you're gonna reproduce the stories you heard from your parents and from your family. So I, I acted as a gray wolf in, 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 in my school, uh, in Hervon uh, in West. This is to, and this is me. Um, yeah, this is my agenda. And it was 1999 when Abdullah Jalam was arrested. And you see a Turkish F-16 killing Apo. And uh, you see uh, here a stickers with Turkish flags. So this was my worldview. And with regards to the Armenian genocide, of course, we also uh, had history as, as, as part of the curriculum. And, and when I started to read about that, and, and I saw uh, a sentence, something like, the black pages in Turkish, or the Ottoman Empire, that they slaughtered one and a half million Armenians. I said, what? This is not true. This is all uh, Western propaganda. So I went to the teacher, and I said, what is this? Explain it to me. And, and <laughs> uh, he's, he was a bit irritated. Go back to your place. It's the truth, boy. And, and uh, I said, it's not my truth. So I decided to, to uh, write a Profilwerkstück, uh, a paper for your last uh, exam. And yeah, that was about the Armenian sequestie. And 
this is to and you see that I totally reproduce the, the Turkish uh, official narrative, and that is based on denial. Um, so I had a huge discussion with uh, with my uh, teacher, uh, Mnir Demaret, and um, yeah, and that was also the reason I wanted to go and study history in 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 Leiden. So. When I went to Leiden, that was also, um, not only I went to college, it was also for me a period that I, for the first time, I left my um, segregated life in, in Old West and in New West. It was mostly Turks or Moroccans. And when I went to Leiden, I went from one segregated area to another segregated area, area with only white students. And, and uh, that was, for me, also very, um, yeah, it was a lonely period because I also uh, was educated in, uh, uh, you know, as an academician. And, and um, it was the period when Theo Fachhoek was murdered. And it was really confusing for me. Uh, a multiple identity crisis were going on. And, um, but I still wanted to do, write my master thesis about the Armenian genocide or as I phrased it back then, like the Armenian question. Um, so I started to re read everything about it. I went to uh, Toronto uh, for the Zorian Institute. I went to uh, Istanbul and uh, uh, dived into the archives and also read all the memoirs of uh, young Turkish uh, uh, leaders. And I was overwhelmed by the enormous um, evidence of, of Turkish evidence of uh, yeah, what is a systematical campaign to destroy the Armenian community and also other communities in, in, uh, in, in the east of Turkey, like the Assyrians and the Aramaic uh, community. So that was a big shock to me, and it took me one year before I was convinced of the systematical and genocidal intention of, of uh, what happened in 1915. Um, yeah, it is, um, before, I, uh, before I go to the last point, I just want to, um, it was a troublesome, uh, it was the end of 2008, and um, it was, it was uh, I was convinced, but I didn't really have the, uh, the guts to, go outside with this knowledge. And it was until 2013 or 14, then uh, I got the uh, yeah, confidence to also uh, reach out and, and uh, talk about the Armenian genocide uh, uh, openly. And uh, that was because of, it is, the Armenian genocide is also a question of identity. Um, um, you know, as it br brought up as a Turkish nationalist, uh, we had, one story with Mustafa Kemal and Ver Talat as heroes. And on the other side, we hear stories that they were mass murderers. So, um, and acknowledging the Armenian genocide automatically means that you are a traitor to your own nation. And, and in talks with human rights activists and also other historians, uh, I came to the conclusion that why, uh, that I shouldn't allow myself to let my identity be filled in by these criminal acts happened in the past, that you should uh, um, yeah, make a distinction and uh, that acknowledging the Armenian genocide as a Turk is not a betrayal of your, of your uh, identity. No, it is them who betrayed humanity and, and uh, um, that's how I coped with, with yeah, the burden of, of the Armenian genocide, and especially for the perpetrator group. So what now? Uh, we still have a status quo in which the Armenian genocide is, is uh, denied uh, with Turkish Islamic supremacy, uh, um, that the Turkish people, the community, is the base for that. Uh, they, uh, it is... Uh, it is non-existent that the Armenian genocide uh, happened. 
and how to, how, to, how to deal with that. And I think that it is important that the Armenian community, but also other communities, that they demand recognition, that they still demonstrate, because that's what led for other people to think uh, about uh, what happened in uh, 100 years ago. And, and, um, but I think it's also important to have dialogue and uh, um, that maybe 5% of all your activities as organizations, uh, it is important to also listen to the other side, whatever they, uh, they are also talking about, because eventually we want a Turkish recognition of the Armenian genocide. And, and to have a Turkish recognition of the Armenian genocide, uh, that's only po uh, uh, possible if you also invest in, in, in the Turkish community and, and talk with them uh, and, 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 and hopefully, uh, eventually we will have a, a future in which the history is recognized and, and um, yeah, the future is more uh, peaceful. Thank you all. Thanks. Just, just a brief question before you go, because you said you, you, you learned to talk about it. When you talk to your family now, or your, is your father still alive? Can you discuss it with him? Um, yeah, it is still really, uh, not only with the Armenian Genocide, but also when I talk about the Kurds, the PKK, mm -hmm. uh, you will get this stamp of, of uh, being a traitor and that you are a hero of the Kurds and Armenians. Even from uh, your father? Yeah, yeah that, that is still, yeah, that's part of my uh, story. So it's not discussed still? It is discussed. Yeah, you know, when I talk with my father, it's not, it, th th those conversations do doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know, other people also listen. Mm -hmm. And I see that um, other people are listening, are more, have a more yeah, nuanced view on, on uh, what happened in 1915. And I think that is also yeah, the part we should focus on. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you uh, both. Before we go to our panel discussion, we have the privilege, privilege to listen to Aktas Erdogan. He studied classical and jazz guitar at the Hague Conservatory. You can sit down. And he was one of the winners of the Istanbul Classic Guitar Festival. Very fit for this evening since Aktas has Turkish, Armenian and Kurdish roots. Um, and you chose, well, first of all, you brought somebody, maybe you can introduce him and then talk about the piece that you picked for this evening. All right. Uh, so I have here one of my very good friend, Ali. And by coincidence, we have both same surname, Erdogan. Mm -hmm. Not any relation. No relation. <laughs> That's solved. Not between each other, also not with, uh, with the president. president yes. <laughs> um, you want to make that clear? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the piece tonight, what is it? Um, the piece tonight, that uh, I picked two pieces actually. For now, we're going to play a dance tune from uh, Erzurum. And uh, it's called Erzurum Shoror, but I don't know the meaning actually. Um, Another tune that we will play tonight, uh, it's, um, it's called Nare Nare. Uh, I made a clip about it after hearing that uh, my grandma's uh, mother was Armenian actually mm -hmm. and uh, survived from, uh, from uh, 1915. Um, he, her, her families found her like uh, 20 years later in the same village that uh, because she came back after the village, she managed to come back years mm -hmm. later. And, uh, but she didn't want to go anywhere because she was married with a Turk, actually, <laughs> and uh, she had children, so she chose to stay. Um, I decided to uh, make a video clip uh, mm -hmm. for her. It was a collaboration of different artists and a dancer. We found a nice desert in the Netherlands. And, uh, you found a desert in the yes. Netherlands. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. It's it's actually it tells about uh, what I really like in that clip that the the choreography <coughs> of the dancer, uh, the the music has two parts. One is the slow, and the other part is the dance. Mm -hmm. There's a part that she falls on the ground, and you expect the the song is ended actually, but then really this fast tune goes on, and then uh, she stands up and starts dancing, and from the desert she walks to the green. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good. Let's hear it. Let's. Here, the Erdogans. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, for the historical context, um, 
I would like to introduce historian Alp Yenen to the stage. He will lead us back to the Ottoman era. He is an historian and lecturer in modern Turkish history at the University of Leiden with a focus on modern Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. And again, he will provide us with the historical overview that may be needed to have the panel discussion. Please have a stage. Thank you very much. It's very touching stories, actually. So, so it's uh, it's not an easy job uh, what I have to do here. So, um, um, I've, I'm here to tell you what happened in 1915. Well, the truth is, everybody knows what happened in 1915. And let me tell you one thing: that everybody knew what happened in 1915 already in 1915. Oops, this is, not more. this is not the current version, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we all know it. I mean, at least for conservative measures, at least 800,000 Armenians or even more have been, have been perished as a result of a government measure to relocate them on a very harsh route to a desert where their arrival was actually unrealistic to begin with. The community leaders were first to be arrested and executed. Among the hundred thousands of deportees, especially men of military age, were removed and subjected to brutal massacres by the gendarmes, paramilitary bands, and tribal brigands. Women were raped and assaulted, if not survived as converted Muslim wives. Children died and perished, if not adopted by shelter homes, or benevolent Muslim neighbors. Those who survived the death marches fell victim to diseases and famine. Only a fraction reached their final destination or achieved to hide and escape. The properties they left behind were disowned and confiscated by the state or by local notables to be never returned. Armenians were condemned to live in exile, spread across multiple countries abroad, if not stay home and come to terms with a state that represented and defended the perpetrators and continued to deny the crime, what everybody knew. The world knew about this while it happened through newspaper reportings, diplomatic dispatches, missionary reports, and, and eyewitness and survivor accounts, which already arrived very early on. Some details were, of course, missing and, and unknown, and others were assumed or speculated to fill in the gaps. However, the end of the story was never a secret nor a mystery. Armenians were displaced, persecuted, and perished en masse as a result of a dreadful government policy within the brutal conditions of war and sectarian violence. These are the undeniable facts, yet it is a complex story why it took a long time to establish what happened in 1915 as a genocide. In 1915, there was of course no such legal term known as genocide. Nevertheless, it would be wrong to assume that people had no conception of an idea of destroying a whole or a part of people. The so-called Young Turk regime, which controlled the Ottoman Empire during World War I, were themselves children of the lost provinces of the Balkans. Muslims of the Balkans were subjected to ethnic religious cleansing and displacement. A generation before, Muslims of the Caucasus had es escaped similar massacres in Russia and found refuge in the Ottoman Empire. And Armenians before, and other Christians too, had suffered from massacres and displacements. State policies of displacing and destructing people was therefore nothing new in the Ottoman Empire or elsewhere in the world of empires. The young Turks knew what they were doing. The young Turks observed in the Balkans an ever repeating pattern of imperial disintegration. I hope this, yeah, let's stay with this. First, this in pattern of integral, uh, imperial disintegration. First, a local revolt started, which resulted in intercommunal violence. 
Second, government measures led to an escalation of the conflict in which revolutionary committees allegedly provoked foreign interventions. Third, and finally, according to this pattern, great powers decided at an international conference that an Ottoman province should be autonomous or independent. The Young Turks had sworn to put an end to this pattern of imperial disintegration, and ironically, their self-centered commitment to save the empire and safeguard its Muslim population would only accelerate this imperial disintegration. In 1914, before the Great War started, the Young Turk regime was even planning to persecute and deport its distrusted Greek population before another war in the Balkans. Once the Ottoman Empire entered the Great War at the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman armies were devastatingly defeated on the Egyptian and Caucasus fronts in early 1915. The deportations took place in, the crisis of, in, in this crisis of imperial ambitions and nationalist fa favor. The Armenians of Anatolia were perceived suddenly as distrusted elements that occupied a very vulnerable line that connected the open shores of the Eastern Mediterranean to the Russian Caucasus. A cult of state security combined with Muslim nationalist resentments against non-Muslims justified in the minds of the Young Turk leadership the cleansing of this region from allegedly threatening Armenians, but also other non-Muslim populations. Not only Armenians, but also Assyrians and Greeks in some other regions were displaced, persecuted, and perished in consequence. In lack of a term to name such a calamity, Armenians called it medziekan, meaning great catastrophe or great crime. It was indeed a great, it was indeed a catastrophic crime and a great crime. And after the end of the war, the young Turk leaders rejected any responsibility in war crimes against Armenians. They had died from a situation of chaos that combined revolt, civil war diseases, as the government argued, but not because of a plan of annihilation. However, there can be no denial that the Young Turk regime and its paramilitary henchmen were guilty of conspiring and executing mass murder and organized theft. Large parts of the local Muslim population were complicit in these crimes. Even if they were not culprits, they were silent bystanders. The problem with a conspiracy as such is that it is commonly clouded by a fog of conspiracy theories. On the one hand, the conspirators themselves produce their own conspiracy theories to distract from their own crimes and to justify their own acts. In this case, the Young Turk regime propagated from the beginning on the existence of an Armenian revolt. And to be sure, there were, in fact, some resistance, revolutionary activism, and even voluntary enrollments in enemy armies among the Armenians. But the reality of an Armenian revolt was mostly exaggerated out of its proportions. Most Armenians remained loyal to the Ottoman Empire until the bitter end. This conspiracy theory was so strong that not only the regime believed what they themselves fabricated and propagated at the first place, but it is until today one of the major pillars of denying claims of genocide. If there was insurgency, if there was resistance among Armenians against the Ottoman state, according to the Turkish state's logic ever since, this means that Armenians provoked if not even deserved what befell them. The moral fallacy of this logic is clear, as threats of resistance and revolt, whether real or not, whether great or not, can never justify mass murder as such. On the other hand, conspiracy theories, conspiracies create another type of theories that might fog clear sight. In making sense of a great crime, concerned outside observers, surviving victims might tend to speculate or imagine an overarching evil scheme. People tend to reduce the complexity and chaos of injustice to a singular cause, yet we must be cautious again not to reduce the complexity 
of the Armenian genocide to oversimplified narratives. Such narratives especially become problematic when they turn to culturalist or essentialist explanations. There was no history of an ancient racial or religious hatred between Kurds, Turks, and Armenians. Not all massacres against Armenians before 1915, especially those in late 1890s, were part of a single genocidal program. It is wrong to assume that the genocide was inevitable because of the rise of Turkish nationalism. Neither was the genocide the result of a barbarian, tribal, oriental mentality of Turks, Kurds, or Muslims. And nor was a clash of civilizations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Yet such reductionist and culturalist narratives ended up building the pillars of many popular narratives of the Armenian genocide until today. And even though their morality and compassion are justified, they don't provide a complex understanding of what happened in 1915. The term genocide was coined only after the Holocaust happened. We know that Raphael Lemkin had the Armenian case in mind when he proposed the legal concept of genocide. On the one hand, the genocide of European Jews restarted a new debate on what happened in 1915. Armenian scholars and activists adopted the Holocaust as a model in campaigning for the recognition of the Armenian genocide. In doing so, the Armenian narrative increasingly underlined the orderly and orchestrated nature of Armenian massacres. On the other hand, the Holocaust also hindered the recognition of the Armenian genocide. The racist ideology that cultivated Nazi anti-Semitism, the systematized organization of state and society at all levels of the Third Reich, and the industrial execution of mass murder under the strict command of the SS set a very high bar for the recognition of the Armenian genocide. This made Turkish denial in many ways easy. By making cheap comparisons to the Holocaust and to Nazi Germany, Armenian suffering or the Ottoman government's complicity could be effectively relativized and denied. A series of assassinations of Turkish diplomats by Armenian activists and later terrorists in 1970s and 1980s further solidified Turkish public's commitment to reject all allegations of genocide and further enhanced this old idea that all Armenians were potential terrorists. While the Armenian side took up a narrative of order in campaigning for the recognition of the Armenian genocide, the Turkish side adopted a narrative of chaos in denying it. As long as scholars believed that genocides were more orderly than chaotic, the Turkish narrative of chaos remained dominant. Despite acknowledgement of Armenian sufferings, larger parts of international academia restrained from using the term genocide or making direct comparisons to the Holocaust. All this changed in the 1990s. Unfortunate cases of further genocides in Rwanda, in Srebrenica and Bosnia changed the debate for good. These new genocides resembled more the Armenian case than the Holocaust. Turkey's campaigning for the recognition of genocidal crimes committed against Bosnian Muslims revealed the moral hypocrisy of Turkey's own denial of the Armenian genocide. Conceptions of genocide were changing. A new generation of genocide scholars were now seeing systematic genocides in times of chaos and chaos in systematic conduct of genocide. There is no contradiction between order and chaos. They commonly accompany each other. We call this complexity. And contrary to Turkish claims, complexity is no excuse for denying responsibility or morality. And contrary to Armenian concerns, complexity is not a false pretense to relativize suffering. In order to illustrate the change in the academic debate, I will briefly point out the publication of two books on the Armenian genocide by two Holocaust scholars, which were published in the very same year of 2005. 
The first book titled Armenian Massacres in Ottoman Turkey was written by Günter Levy, who is an American Jewish emeritus professor of political science. Levy, a scholar of Holocaust and himself a survivor of the Holocaust, subscribed to a more limited understanding of genocide, which was very much defined by the unique standards of the Nazi persecution of Jews as a mean in itself. Therefore, Levy was not convinced that the Armenian case constitutes a genocide, despite its tragic outcome. Levy was celebrated in Turkey, but condemned by critics as a denialist and a Turkish agent. But more importantly for us, however, the new generation of genocide scholars expressed their discontent with Levy's exclusivist understanding of genocide. The second book, also published in 2005, The Great Game of Genocide, by Donald Bloxham, and Bloxham, a British historian who belongs to a younger generation of Holocaust scholars put the Armenian case into the context of World War I. He illustrated how the young Turk regime got increasingly radicalized and opted for genocidal policies in the process. This offered a functionalist and more inclusivist understanding of genocide that is rather defined by its decisions and processes and allowed room for complexity and contingency. Bloxham's book, although he was not a historian of the Ottoman Empire, was praised in a very important review article by one of the greatest Ottoman historians of our time, late Donald Quartet. And Quartet, Quartet's praise of Bloxham was the most prominent coming out of a, of a senior scholar of Ottoman history. And since 2005, recent publications on the Armenian genocide have been providing an ever more complex narratives, but remain straightforwardly compassionate about Armenian suffering. However, the field of Ottoman and Turkish studies was already in a process of change in 2005. Scholars in Turkey and scholars of Turkish and Kurdish origin living abroad were already revising and uh, reviewing the official narratives of Turkey. Again, in 2005, a conference was organized in Istanbul for the first time that brought together scholars and researchers who openly talked about what happened in 1915. Ever since thereafter, Armenian genocide was no more a taboo word for the Turkish intelligentsia. Although the situation in Turkey today is anything but optimistic, and freedom of speech is restricted, we should not forget that all major international works on the Armenian genocide are being translated and published in Turkey. Turkish and Kurdish people read them and they write new ones. They debate and challenge old narratives and try to come to terms with their own history of violence by providing more complex narratives. Meanwhile, the state's own denialist narrative remained static, if not regressive, throughout these times of change. There is hardly any international backing for their narrative except for few of marginal academics. As I argued here, the complexity of what happened in 1915 has been important for its recognition as a genocide among scholars. My proposition at the beginning remains unchanged. Everybody knows what happened in 1915. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to now welcome our uh, panel, uh, and we'll continue this discussion. Lili Sprangers, the manager of the Leiden Asia Center, formerly the director of the Independent Turkey Institute. Um, you can take one of the seats, except for that one. <laughs> um, also here, Alexis Dermijan, he's a trial lawyer at the International Criminal Court in The Hague and the editor of the book The Armenian Genocide Legacy. Please welcome. Yeah. And our third <laughs> panelist um, is a colleague of mine, a journalist from the Telegraaf daily newspaper. Uh, he covers foreign affairs and defense, Niels Richter. <clears throat> Thank you all very much for coming. We'll talk for, let's say, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for, uh, for questions. Um, Lili Sprangers, I would like to, to start with you to talk from... Oh, 
yeah, like, thanks. From a, a, a Turkish point of view, and um, we already heard a lot, a lot about it, why it's important for the Tur Turks. But while our two guests here were talking about their personal stories, I was thinking in, in, in what sense is this also a generational uh, thing, meaning that uh, when other generations grow up in Turkey, this issue will maybe um, be easier to talk about, or is that not the case? Sorry, you have to use the mic. Yeah. The funny thing is, of course, that there were generations in Turkey that grew up with the narrative as you just told. Mm -hmm. um, I know many people uh, in Turkey, but also Turks who migrated to the Netherlands, who knew that their grandparents were telling the stories about the Armenian massacre or mm -hmm. relocation or whatever term they used. But there were, uh, in villages, uh, church that were destroyed, <coughs> houses that were destroyed. So, to a certain extent, it was part of the collective memory in Turkey until somewhere in the 70s, and especially, of course, after the 19s, when the Asaladi, uh, Armenian secret uh, liberation army with its uh, attacks on uh, Turkish dip diplomats more or less urged the uh, government to make a national narrative and to impose that narrative on almost everybody in the schools, in the public debate, in the discussion, etc. etc. Um, and what you see now is that the window of recognition that was open till between 2004 and 2010. 12, 2013, is now closed again because of the developments in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, to my uh, personal opinion, I don't have any other opinion, to my opinion, um, the Kurdish issue, the recognition of the Armenian genocide can only take place in a more democratic environment. And mm -hmm. as long as the government wants to impose all kinds of narratives, the post-coup narrative, etc., etc., on uh, the public discourse is going to be very difficult for mm -hmm. individual intellectuals, academicians, uh, journalists, of course, out of the question that they would say anything on mm -hmm. this, to confront the government with the other narrative. So I think for the time to come, you're basically looking at the situation that would only get worse. And in mm -hmm. top of that, I mean, I was surprised to learn that almost all books are being uh, translated mm -hmm. and available in Turkey, because one of the big big problems for the development of a discourse in Turkey is that there's only a small minority of people who manage to be who are able to read in other language. Mm -hmm. About 86% of the Turks has only access to the Turkish language, so it's very difficult to go on the internet and look mm -hmm. at American sources, German sources, or whatever. So I wouldn't be too optimistic about what's going to happen in the few next generations. Is this discussion about the Armenian genocide also a political tool in the way that Erdogan, in this case, always needs um, a foreign enemy? No, you you need occasions like this to No, he doesn't need unify. the Armenians for that right now. He has plenty no, no, but of this, enemies. No, this, this particular discussion, I mean. Well, I mean, th that is, of course, something of the last few years, but you have, th in 2009, when uh, Davutoglu was still uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. he went to Zurich and they signed with the Armenian government a protocol, which was never um, uh, fully recognized in both countries, that they would start to mend diplomatic relations. So at a certain point, they were happy to do so. Now, the reason why they don't is, of course, their, uh, uh, their uh, how would you say, their... Uh, loyalty to the uh, to Azerbaijan, eh, which always comes into play. There is a yeah. direct line between that, and also the fact that um, we, in the more and more nationalist rhetoric that Erdogan, yeah, your uncle, uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, has been developing over the past few years. Um, Europe, of course, is the bad boy, and uh, any pressure for Europe will no longer work. Right. So uh, the idea that the Turks are the master of their own national history mm -hmm. is something that is very profound in Turkey right now. Right. So that is completely unlikely uh, to square with the recognition mm. of... Uh, so you don't see any, any change in this happening, no, happening soon. Why is it so important that this is being discussed? That, not just here, but in a broader sense. Well, the Armenian genocide is just one of the major genocides of the 20th century. And in terms of why it is important to talk about it today, um, well, no, there's two lessons that I could see. One is quite obvious, that we learn from past mistakes. And, and we learn that mankind can be very cruel uh, to one another. And that in Never the end, again. 
sorry. Never again. The so-called never again. Uh, and then even despite the adoption of the Genocide Convention in 1948, you had many other genocides such as Cambodia, Rwanda, and it, and it continues to happen. The second more nuanced uh, lesson that I, that I gather as to the relevance of discussing it today is that we have this term that has become um, a fighting ground. Is it genocide? Is it not genocide? Mm -hmm. And the sad story about this is that if you go back uh, to another term, crimes against humanity, the first time it was used was in May of 1915 when the Allies used that term in their declaration mm -hmm. to state that crimes against humanity are being committed. It was not a philosophical or, or legal legally thought term at the time, and it is only with Nuremberg that we see crimes against humanity come to life. Mm -hmm. But we only have a genocide convention. So if people in Darfur or people in Iraq today want their suffering to be recognized, what do they have to brandish? The genocide convention. Right. But genocide is a very difficult crime to mm -hmm. prove. Mm -hmm. And crimes against humanity does not have a convention, and it is high time that we have a convention on the prevention and the punishment of crimes against humanity. Why? Because the Genocide Convention provides an obligation to prevent and to punish genocide. Mm -hmm. It's on every nation, even if you haven't signed the convention, you have an obligation to prevent and punish. And we don't have that for crimes against humanity, although the term was used for a very first time in the context of the Armenian Genocide. When we talk about what happened, and I'll, Yenon also talked a bit, a bit about this, the discussion is not about what took place, but more about whether what did take place adds up to it being called a genocide or not. Right. Well, so I mean, if you well, can Well, I mean, is, is the historic, uh, what, what part of the historic, what happened historically is being um, discussed, or is it mostly a discussion right. about how you right. It's a call bit of it. both. It's a bit of both. I think you have a recognition, I mean, Turkey, the, the government recognizes, what is the number, 300,000 Armenians were killed during relocations. I mean, if you think about the number alone, 300,000, it's a lot already to begin with. Uh, but they, they do uh, question the fact of a methodically planned and orchestrated, uh, uh, yeah, massacres leading to, to a genocide. The label itself is, is debated, of course, and it's a very legal debate. It's a very uh, it's a very technical term, genocide. The distinction between extermination, mm -hmm. which is a crime against humanity, and genocide is the intent to destroy. It's a very specific, very legal qualification, and it's not readily, readily accessible mm -hmm. to the general public. The layman will not necessarily know what's the difference, right. extermination, genocide, but it is a very particular legal term which applies to scenarios like the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust. Genocide we, is the same, but then with intent. And then with the, the so you have. So not the same, worse, basically. So you have, you have the list of crimes that can be genocide. For example, killings or preventing births. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the mental intent to commit murder. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you have to have the, the intent to kill with the intent to destroy the group in whole or in part. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a very technical legal debate, but on the ground, the victims are suffering the same right. thing. It's murder, of it's course. rape, it's destruction, it's the same crimes. But of course, a genocide requires a bit more of a policy. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is that distinction as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a debate on the qualification of the term, as well but as there is also a debate on right. what happened. Okay. Before we go to the Dutch position with, with Niels, uh, just briefly, e either one of you, um, many countries have recognized the massacre as being a genocide, not all have. Can you talk a little bit about that? What is, is there a geographical divide in who has and who hasn't? Well, um, recognize, recognition is, of course, uh, can also be varied. I mean, in the Netherlands, the sure. situation, uh, you will explain later, is also uh, ambiguous in, yeah, a, in a sense. A but if you look at the uh, geographical uh, division of countries that do not accept uh, uh, the term uh, genocide, then you only end up with uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Because in all the other countries, you can say it's genocide and most people will go along. Mm -hmm. The governments may not have officially recognized it, but right. in general, they speak about genocide. Right. So it's very a very small group of countries that does not go along. And international organizations uh, as well. I think they all 
I mean, what well, about the United Nations? Well, then? they're a bit more ambiguous about right. that. Okay. I mean, you have the 1985 report by a British uh, reporter, Whittaker, Benjamin Whittaker, who used the Armenian genocide as one example of genocides. But since then, the United Nations has not really taken a stance or a position. And uh, maybe there isn't a forum for that, uh, unless you bring the case before the International Court of Justice, which mm -hmm. I would not advocate for. Nobody wants to see it, because we saw Serbia versus Bosnia was a huge debacle in 2007. Right. So international organizations, they have their own mandate. They're doing their own work. So I don't even expect them to, to make a finding. But a declaration is always good. A recognition, even for the Dutch government, wouldn't hurt in the sense that we're all part of this global community. Mm -hmm. We're all members, whether it's the Netherlands, whether it's France, Italy, and so on. And making that recognition is a form of satisfaction right. to the victim group. Right? It's one of those, those three things that you have under international law. Restitution which we can't, we can't bring back those lives. Mm -hmm. You have compensation for financial losses. Mm -hmm. And then the third element is satisfaction. Mm -hmm. By recognizing the genocide, mm -hmm. what the states are doing is providing some form of satisfaction right. to the victim group. Which brings us to the Dutch uh, point of view, Niels. What is the official Dutch government position and how does it compare to the rest of uh, The Hague? Because uh, as was said, it's ambivalent. Well, the standpoint of the Dutch government is a very Dutch standpoint, of course. It's a compromise between what the parliament wants and what the government um, thinks it's, um, well, uh, legally plausible. <laughs> um, they, they took the, uh, uh, they, they speak of uh, the uh, Armenian genocide as the matter of the Armenian genocide. Whether That's what the, the government says. Well, uh, uh, and then at the same time, the parliament uh, has always er uh, tried to convince the, uh, the government to, uh, to acknowledge, fully acknowledge, the Armenian genocide as a genocide. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, has been tried in 2004, then again in 2015. Now, uh, the Christian Democrats and the uh, Christian Union is in the government, and as a part of uh, the coalition agreement, uh, it was agreed that uh, somebody, uh, a representative of an, on a government level, was sent to Yerevan to uh, take place in the commemorance uh, of the Armenian genocide. Right. Well, you can um, explain this as uh, acknowledgement because one is not there to acknowledge the matter of the uh, right. Armenian genocide yeah. so but but still in all the official letters uh, the phrase is uh, the matter of the Armenian genocide right well there's it's, it's very Dutch position indeed the, 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 there's a, a party in, there has been a party in parliament, DENK, over the past uh, couple of years. They have two parliamentarians, small party, very, uh, sorry, three uh, parliamentarians, small party still, very pro Erdogan. Um, I, 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 it, I guess I, it's pretty clear where they stand. Is this important to them? Do they keep bringing it up or not that much? Yes, yes, because they, they keep playing the the Dutch, uh, the, the Turkish nationalist uh, agenda into the, uh, the Dutch uh, parliament. Of course, this, this matter has always been very sensible to uh, parties, whether it be uh, Christian Democrats or Social Democrats with uh, members of parliament or, or candidates of, of, of Turkish uh, nationality, um, because whatever, whatever standpoint, they were taking, if they were acknowledging the Armenian genocide, they got troubles with the, with the Turkish people who voted for them. Yeah. And if they didn't, they were kicked out of the party, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, after uh, the last election, uh, Denk, with two Turkish uh, uh, or uh, Dutch Turkish uh, uh, parliamentarians, um, they played out this matter uh, in, in, in the way which is, well, uh, they always, uh, the uh, standpoint of the Dutch parliament is clear. Whole parliament, except for these three, three. Mm -hmm. uh, DENK members, uh, they acknowledge the Armenian genocide. 
what they do is they come, come up with a motion, ask for, uh, for a roll call in which uh, every single member of parliament has to raise his hand and uh, answer the question if they do or do not recognize this uh, genocide. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they make videos out of it. And for, Naming and shaming. Yes, and uh, the, 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 they uh, shame the, 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 the Turkish uh, MPs as, well, bad Turks, basically. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, some of them had got uh, threatened by, well, Anonymous mm -hmm. Turks, I suppose. Right. Um, now, the Dutch government, Minister Kaag has said, uh, I think it was last year, the year before, the Security Council of the UN, uh, nor the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, has ever issued a judgment on this matter. And therefore, the minister said, we have to tread very um, careful. From a, you, you're laughing already f uh, as a, somebody who knows the ICC and international law. Uh, is she hiding behind something, or is it, is it a valid point? You just reminded me uh, that as an international civil servant, I was duty-bound to say at the very beginning that although I'm here today as an employee of the ICC, I'm speaking in my private capacity. Right. Just course. to make that clear. <laughs> Some right. of you know right. what I'm talking about. So, look, you don't need to That's have... That's very a, promising. Go it on. is, <laughs> indeed. You do not need a judgment to be able to use the word genocide. This is the eternal debate that I have with my historian friends who say, well, you know, why can't I use the word genocide even if there is no judgment? Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a judgment in Srebrenica that it was genocide, and some historians will tell you, well, we don't think that it was genocide. Mm -hmm. So, no, uh, there is, the ICC, first of all, will never look at the Armenian genocide. It does not have jurisdiction. It only has jurisdiction over crimes committed after 2002, number one. The United Nations Security Council could make, if they wish, a declaration. That would be very nice of them, and I would welcome it. Uh, and perhaps it would put an end to it, but I don't think it will. Look at uh, the case of Serbia. There are multiple judgments at the ICTY stating that what happened in Srebrenica was genocide, and they still don't accept it. Mm -hmm. So judgments, there is a gap. There is a gap between judgments and how a society accepts mm -hmm. these, these rulings by international bodies. Mm -hmm. And it is the role of civil society to then disseminate these judgments uh, because courts can only do so much. Mm -hmm. We can only make findings of facts and right. responsibility of perpetrators. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's mm -hmm. really up to politicians, right. journalists, and civil society mm -hmm. to then integrate those judgments throughout the society. I would say that this is a matter that politicians want to keep kicking ahead of them until the next cabinet and the next cabinet. Yeah, and they choose to, um, uh, to take this from a, from a legal uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a heavily politicized uh, matter, mm -hmm. they and say... And the well, legal point of view as yeah, well. Yeah, and they, 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 and they say, well, it does have legal consequences if we acknowledge uh, that it's a genocide. Mm -hmm. because. Now, um, uh, the Dutch government uh, acknowledges uh, the crimes of uh, the massacres of uh, Daesh as, uh, as genocide. Right. And that leads to the obligation to, do, so yeah, right. to, to uh, do something about it, to uh, help uh, fight, uh, to prosecute uh, right. uh, members of Daesh. So they didn't want to set a, a precedent. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the uh, official explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are lots of other uh, angles to it, like the, the diplomatic relationship with, uh, with Turkey right. and uh, the relationship with uh, almost 700,000 uh, uh, Turkish, uh, mm -hmm. Dutch... Uh, How many? Uh, like like a half a million? million? Yeah. yeah. 400,000. Yeah. That's still... That's, 700, that's, 700, sorry. That, that's, still, that's still a lot. Yeah. Before we go to the audience uh, on, on this matter, and you mentioned compensation as one of the three uh, 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 pillars, is that uh, Lily Sprangers also um, uh, one reason for the Turkish government to, to be so tough on this? The fear of reparations, uh, financial compensation? To Does that have to do with it? Extent, there would be some, but you have to use the microphone. Sorry. There would be some, but it's very difficult to, to, to do that. You saw that after the uh, 
uh, reunification of Germany. I mean, people from the United States who claimed the half of Brandenburg, uh, which of course <laughs> it was very over the top, but it's going to be very difficult. I don't think that's one of the main reasons mm -hmm. for them not to do it. I think it has to do with loss of face. Uh, you have to tell your own people that you have been lying for decades, not only the AKP government, but all the previous governments for the past 30 years, so that's very difficult. Like you were pointing out, civil society comes into play, but of course that civil society is almost dead in Turkey. So you will have to talk from government to people that a whole people, uh, 76 million people, uh, well, let's say not all of them, but 60 million people have to revise their view on this particular history historical event in which, like uh, Typhoon's father, many of them in a period and many of them take proud in. So that's mm -hmm. going to be extremely difficult. I do not know, I'm sorry, going Dutch now, but if those in the audience recall that Queen Beatrix went to the Knesset, uh, the Israeli parliament, and told the Knesset that the image of the Netherlands in uh, the Second World War was com no, not completely distorted, she didn't use that word, but was somewhat distorted by the Anne Frank symbol. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in the world, or in, in, the, in Europe, were so many Jews killed as in the Netherlands during the Second World War. Now, you can have a lot of historical explanations, but that already led to an outcry in the Netherlands, and that is something that was already been debating for decades, that there was a gray, a black, white, call it. But if somebody would go on television and say that you have to revise the entire historical story about what happened in 1915, that would be political suicide. So nobody's going to do that. And then you would, ha you would meet a society where people would believe that you were being, as a politician, being bought by the Mossad or the CIA. I mean, Turkey is fond of conspiracy theories, so everybody would have an explanation. But it has to be something that has to go in Turkey top down, but there has to be some kind of uh, belief in society that this is really the story which, which prevails. Mm. And for the, the Turkish government to bring that mm. into... Uh, it's not going to happen it, soon. It's going to be so tremendously difficult. Right. Let's go to audience questions, if there are any. I'm just thinking about a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Are there questions for one of the panel members? Yeah. Um, this question isn't necessarily directed to any of you, but feel free to answer it. But I was recently thinking about um, back in 2015 when a lot of, the, a lot of countries recognized the Armenian Genocide as a political tool to kind of push themselves against Erdogan. So what do, what do you guys could, what can you guys say about that, about how it was used as a political tool and not necessarily a historical one? Thank you. Anyone? When was this? 2015, yourself. Oh, a hundred year commemoration. Right. Um, I, I don't think most countries that did so intended to do it in a way that it would offend Erdogan. I think that was a sincere uh, move to uh, ask for uh, uh, attention on the 100, 100 year of commemoration. Uh, of course, in Turkey it was being seen as such, but it has been seen all the way ever since the pressure from, pressure, uh, pressure from the European Union occurred that although recognition was not an official criterion to join the EU, but it, that would really help, especially in France, to mold public opinion more favorably towards Turkey, it has been seen as something like the, well, the extension of the Sèvres uh, uh, treaty. Uh, what, what, what they didn't succeed to do with Sèvres, they're now trying to do by making us uh, uh, admit something that didn't happen in the way they, they think it is. So I don't think the intention behind that was a pun to Erdogan. It did, of course, work that way within Turkey. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Somebody, yeah. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, it might seem more of a comment, but feel free to uh, provide your views. Uh, I have the impression that Dutch standpoint when it comes to recognition is very similar to the UK's standpoint. And I had the chance to work with Alex on a chapter on, well, which basically digged UK archives to find out what's the reason of the UK not recognizing the events as genocide and what comes out from the archives at all levels of UK diplomats is that it's something inconvenient. It's better not to call it genocide 
and for two main reasons. A, because we do not have proper standing to call it genocide, and B, not to upset economic or demographic uh, sensitivities. So that's basically the same reasons as, as for the Netherlands. Right? That's what I believe yeah. it is. Yeah. A big Turkish diaspora, right. or Dutch citizens of Turkish descent, mm -hmm. and economic interest, mm. which is obviously higher with, uh, compared to Armenia. Yeah. Is that different in um, uh, Germany, for instance, another country with a large um, a Turkish population? Does anybody know? I know you're not Germany expert, but maybe you know well, about I, I was director of the Germany Institute before I founded the Turkey Institute. I should have uh, known. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't know what their official position is right mm -hmm. now. I should, I should uh, to my shame, acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, Germany has always, or oh, not always, since 1945, right. has been on the side of the victims as much as yeah. it can. So I think uh, that Armenians find a very receptive ear in right. the Bundeskanzleramt, but I'm not quite sure what their official, I don't think yeah, they did. Finally recognized that a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, uh, they finally did. The government? Yes. yes. The government. Yes. Okay. There is a special clause on uh, comparison with uh, the Holocaust. Sorry? There is a special clause in the recognition of the Armenian genocide in Germany by the German uh, parliament that, uh, that it should not be seen as equal uh, to, uh, to oh. the Holocaust of the Jews. So there is kind of a, a clause there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Interesting. This is wisdom of the crowds. You know, with everybody's help, we'll get there. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question to you and to Niels. Like newspapers and television, it's a powerful medium. To what extent do you feel responsibility in this case, like if it meet, needs more attention or more power in this medium? That's a question for Niels. <laughs> well, I know, uh, I know. Uh, I, 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 of course, I feel that that uh, <clears throat> obligation uh, and I think with with this issue with this ha always has been the the evergreen of Dutch uh, political debates uh, on uh, foreign affairs so I think I did take the opportunity even in a, a few phrases to tell what what happened but of, of course in a, in a, uh, article of 300 words, one cannot uh, do justice to a matter which is so complex like uh, the Armenian genocide. But sure, uh, if we do have the chance, we should talk about it, of course. Mm -hmm. Without taking, uh, obviously, a moral... I mean, it's, uh, by mainly just covering the debate in The Hague, I would say we have a correspondent in, in Turkey. Whenever it's a matter there, we'll discuss it on our program. I, I don't think it's either his newspaper or my program's um, job to, uh, you know, either push the government or not that they would listen. Um, uh, but yeah, attention is needed. I, I, to be quite honest, I mean, my program has been existing for 20 years and, and we've, we've covered this, but. Um, Maybe it's been a few years, I don't know. It, you know, you need some kind of angle, I suppose. Any other questions? Yeah. To uh, Mr. Richter, um, I think it's interesting that he calls the uh, new coalition and the uh, role that Christian Union and Christian Democrats play in it as a, a special and positive thing that someone went to uh, Yerevan and next year someone will go again from government. But is it so positive? Because it was just a little uh, thing that they got back for um, uh, letting go their normal standpoint on Armenian genocide, which they did in so many motions. Uh, not only those two parties, even the 66, the Democrats, uh, who voted for a motion uh, that the government should recognize the Armenian genocide. And now, when the same motion is there that they, two years ago, just before the coalition, they put on the agenda themselves, now they're voting against. Do you think that's still a positive thing that came out of the coalition? 
Well, it depends on your optimism, of course, and uh, uh, of course the, the the parties who were very much in favour to uh, to deal with this once and for all, they were very uh, optimistic and positive because they thought it was the maximum which they, they could get out of this, of course. And uh, yes, you're right, the government still doesn't fully recognize the genocide as genocide. They call it the matter of the Armenian genocide, which, well, we can hardly say it's a full, full recognition of, of the facts. But still, if uh, you send someone over uh, with the commemorance, uh, that's a form of recognition, and I suppose that is as good as it gets. So. Whether that's a positive thing, I don't know, but uh, today there were um, Armenians in front of the uh, parliamentary building uh, asking the government for uh, recognition, but it was, a, 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 um, it was not very loud. Uh, the debate hmm. was outside parliament and not in parliament. It, 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 it has taken so many years for uh, for the parliament to get the government this far, so... But I guess, it, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess it's fair to say that if, if with, with a coalition with two Christian parties, as we have right now, and you don't get full recognition, we won't get a, a coalition this Christian in, in the near future, so I guess that will mean that there will never be full recognition. No, but, but at the same time, this is a small step, and I think, well, we, we, one can see things happening because um, today or last week uh, uh, a member of parliament of the Christian Union sat down with uh, MP from Denk and they were discussing if they could have some, for, some form of uh, hearing in uh, Congress about the matter uh, and of course uh, like one can foresee uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Kuzu of Denk will invite uh, historians uh, who uh, underline his ideas and, uh, and the, Christ the, the Christian politician will uh, invite other po uh, uh, historians. But, well, at least they talk to each other, mm -hmm. try to solve, to mm -hmm. solve it and, and, and talk about it like we uh, talk, uh, talk about it here. So. Okay. Uh, a final question for uh, Lili Sprangers. O over the past year, um, Erdogan has called the killings uh, inhumane. This year he sent uh, a few <laughs> tweets in Armenian. Is there any meaning to that? Um, well, it's not totally unmeaningful, of course, and he has, he's gone even beyond that. I think a couple of years ago, he made a declaration which was not, of course, not recognized, but it was very, very much more mm -hmm. than previous governments, including his own, had done. Um, but I, I think this is not the right time for him to do so. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, given his whole nationalistic rhetoric that he has been developing over the past few years, he is now in a co more or less a coalition with the MHP, which is the most national party, nationalist party that you have in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Without them, he would probably not win the next election. So he's not going, I don't think he's going to do that. And MHP is very much anti-Kurdish and very much anti-recognition. And the politicians that he is depending on, also mm -hmm. in his own party, mm -hmm. uh, they are very much anti-Kurdish. And in general, you see that those who are anti-Kurdish are also very much anti-recognition because that has to do with their nationalistic distorted idea of what Turkey's mm. future and Turkey's history is so I don't think he will go beyond this and it is not unmeaningful but it is not of course any step towards recognition mm. or mm. what would come close to it okay thank you so much all three uh, thank you the panel and thanks the audience uh, if we can Leave the stage to our uh, musical guests um, because they will um, uh, play another song to conclude this evening. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. Thanks all our guests for your uh, insights. Um, I guess this was an example of how, even if it's just in a small venue, uh, this um, reconciliation should begin. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, keep coming to the Bali and the bar is open. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very thanks much. a lot.